If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory. We'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales and master detective novels. And I'm Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor, and I focus on stories by, for, and about women. On today's episode, Valerie pitched the game so that we can study left brain stories. This 1997 film was directed by David Fincher from a screenplay by David Fincher, Michael Ferris, and John Brancanto. Of course, there will be spoilers because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. And please help other writers find our show by leaving a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Simply go to the show's landing page and scroll to the bottom. It's that simple. Now, before we just quickly go on to talk about this movie, I just want to say to people that I'm currently on the road. Um, it's Christmas time as we're recording this video. So I'm in a different <laughs> different environment. So you may hear, I'm actually in a dungeon, you may hear um, creaking of floors, uh, people talking in the distance. So just please bear with me while, um, while I'm with my family over Christmas. That's how dedicated you are. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, that's true, I suppose. <laughs> My family, not so dedicated. <laughs> They're aware, but do they care? I don't know. <laughs> well, we appreciate you taking time out of your Christmas holidays to spend with us. Oh, yes. Well, you know, this is the thing, right, with us being on different sides of the world and uh, and our summer holidays being over the Christmas holidays. So, you know, you're, you're having white Christmases. I'm I'm sitting out in the sun trying to work out how I can get to the beach. Oh, my God. That is like salt in the wounds. Very different. I'll very sit here different. in the ice and snow <laughs> thinking about you on the beach. Oh, my God. Okay. Before I get depressed, let's get on to the game. <laughs> yep. All right. Let's get on with the game. So you're going to uh, – this is an interesting movie this week. So so you can explain, you can explain this All one. Right. I will do my best. Okay, so the game does fit the category of a left brain story. Um, I know because I came up with the idea of a left brain story. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> so what I mean by a left brain story is basically a story that appeals to our heads more than our hearts. Uh, so we're trying to, like the point of the story is that we're trying to figure out what exactly is going on. All right. The game is certainly not a mystery and it's not a crime story. I would call it a thriller. But if you think back to episode one, I said that left brain stories can pop up in multiple genres, maybe even all genres. I'm not sure. I haven't studied it that in depth yet, but it wouldn't surprise me to find it in all kinds of different genres. But the real reason I chose the game is because when I got to the end of it after the first viewing, I was really disappointed. I remember sitting there thinking, what, is that it? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I felt like my time had been wasted. So I really wanted to go and take a closer look to figure out what caused me to have that reaction. And I'm really glad I did because Melanie, you and I have said this many times before, and I know we said it on the Roundtable podcast as well, we can often learn a lot more from stories that do not work or that don't capture our imaginations than from the stories that do. Now, in a nutshell, the problem that I have with the game is that what the main character, Nicholas, is going through, it really is a game. If you've not seen the movie, the idea is that you've got this bored rich guy, Nicholas Van Orton, and he registers to take part in a kind of simulation. So, you know, for example, a participant might be taking part in a pretend spy game or a pretend murder mystery, something like that. So Nicholas's brother, Conrad, has given him this game for his 48th birthday present. All right, so far, so good. 
Nicholas begins the game and we all, and by we all, I mean Nicholas and the audience, we all think that it's just a fun but exciting game until random people start to try to kill him. And then we're thinking, oh, okay, this isn't a game. There's more to this than meets the eye. So for example, Nicholas gets into a cab and the cab driver sends the vehicle at high speed over a wharf into what I assume is San Francisco Bay. We don't expect Nicholas's life to actually be in danger in a game, right? So this makes us think that there is something more going on here and we begin to try to figure it out. That's the left brain part of the story. It's engaging our minds. It is making us think. The problem is that it really is a game. <laughs> and so Nicholas's life never really was at risk at all. And I just wondered what the point of all of this was. I mean, sure, within the story, I get that the that the point of the game was to shake Nicholas out of his rut. But I mean, what was the point of me watching it? <laughs> it's the same feeling that you get when you find out that the whole story that you've been invested in was nothing but a dream. Now, with the possible exception of Newhart, Bob Newhart's second show, that kind of thing never works. So last week I said that I ruled out Luke as the killer because if the person who everyone at least in the beginning of the story, suspects has done it. If that person has actually done it, it's not a very interesting story and the game proves my point. But there's more to it than that. If I'm being honest with myself and with you, I was feeling blasé about the whole movie. And that's unusual for me because this kind of story, this is usually right up my alley. So I wanted to know why I failed to engage. With left brain stories, it's not only a question of empathy. So, I mean, I've talked ad nauseum about empathy. And empathy is really all about hooking a reader or viewer emotionally. Left brain stories have to hook the reader or viewer intellectually. And I was not hooked. So why is that? Well, <laughs> It'll come as no surprise to you when I say that the reason I was not hooked is because the game fails to deliver on the basic fundamentals of storytelling. There is no clear object of desire, no clear stakes. They rely heavily on coincidence. The clues don't make sense, which leads to plot problems. And Nicholas is, for the most part, a passive protagonist. Now, I could do an hour on every one of these topics, but I will try to be as succinct as possible. I'll start with objects of desire and stakes. Um, but, you know, honestly, all of these topics are sort of tangled up with one another. So in the beginning of the movie, Nicholas does not have an object of desire. He does in the second half, and basically he wants information. But in the first half, he wants for nothing. Yeah, he seems bored with his privileged life, but there's no indication that he wants to change his life or that he desires action or excitement. Even if he did, why would he do what Conrad recommends? It is clear that Conrad makes poor decisions in life, and he has needed Nicholas to bail him out of trouble. It's clear that Nicholas does not care for Conrad's uh, decision-making abilities. Now, when Nicholas does go and investigate CRA, which is the company that uh, hosts the game, he's told that the registration process will take a couple of hours. But in fact, it takes the entire day. Now, why would a busy businessman like Nicholas, who does not have a strong desire for change, allow himself to be delayed like that? He's got a lot of busy, important meetings. There's millions and millions of dollars at stake with deals that he is currently dealing with. Why would he allow himself to be delayed bit by bit by bit? Nicholas Van Orton would see that kind of a delay as an indication of poor business practices. And if the registration took longer than expected, that longer than he was told it would take, he would have just walked out. But let's just say for the sake of argument that Nicholas does desire a change and excitement in his life. 
The question then becomes, first of all, what or who is standing in the way of him getting it? And then what happens if he doesn't get it? So who is the antagonist? Who or what is the antagonist? And what are the stakes? Nicholas is extremely wealthy. If he wanted a life of excitement, he could have it. Presumably, Van Orten Industries has hundreds of employees, although we only see a lawyer and a, a secretary. <laughs> there must be, logic dictates that there must be a 2IC who can take over while Nicholas goes on vacation, even if it's one of those adventure vacations, if excitement is what he wants. Nicholas is healthy and relatively young. There is no reason that he couldn't do exciting things if that's what he wanted. So there is nothing external to Nicholas that is keeping him from achieving his object of desire. Since this is a thriller, we're expecting the force of antagonism to be external. Now, it could be that Nicholas himself is the antagonist. In other words, he is his own worst enemy. He's the one holding himself back from living an exciting life that he desires. But one, we don't get any indication that that's the case. And two, when the force of antagonism is internal, we're not dealing with a thriller. We're dealing with some kind of internal genre story. All righty. What happens then if the status quo continues, if Nicholas is not able to get out of the rut that he is in? Well, the answer is nothing. He'll continue to be healthy. He'll continue to have lots of money and a very successful company. He'll continue to live in a beautiful, well-maintained home. He'll also continue to be single, but that seems to suit him just fine. Like his personal life is not a focus in this film whatsoever. You could make the argument that eventually Nicholas's own life is at stake. Well, in the second half of the movie anyway, except that it isn't because this is all a game. And we learn that his life was never, ever in danger anyway. It was only meant to look like it was. They wanted him to think that his life was in danger. Uh, but of course, there were all kinds of safety measures and checks and balances in place. So it turns out that nothing bad was ever going to happen to him. My guess is that the idea behind this movie is that Nicholas is supposed to discover the meaning in his life. He's supposed to understand that life is not all about money. Or maybe he's supposed to realize that while his father may have died when his father was 48, his life isn't over and he needs to live his life to its fullest. And remember, his father died at 48, and this is Nicholas's 48th birthday. But these ideas as themes are not well executed at all. Now, in terms of Nicholas being a passive protagonist, that's a consequence of the premise of the story, I think. The idea is that he has entered a game where things will happen to him and he'll have to react. The nature of the game is that he cannot be an active protagonist. So this clown shows up, he receives phone calls, people follow him, the cab driver tries to kill him, his tire goes flat, etc. But that doesn't mean he is entirely passive. I mean, this is not the accidental tourist here. <laughs> Thank God for small mercies. <laughs> for example, uh, when Nicholas thinks that the publisher is the one who has framed him in the... Uh, with, with the uh, sex tapes and the Polaroids and that kind of stuff, Nicholas tries to take legal action. Of course, he very quickly learns that the publisher had nothing to do with it whatsoever, but he does try to be proactive at some points in the story. And then there are all of the coincidences and plot problems. I'll name just a couple of them because, you know, time is running on here. Uh, but if you've seen the movie, I'm willing to bet that you've already detected them. So the plot relies on Nicholas bringing the clown into his den. And frankly, it does not ring true. I'm not buying it. The clown is positioned like his father's dead body after Mr. Van Orton committed suicide by jumping off the roof of his house. <laughs> this is a really cheery movie. <laughs> so Nicholas drives home uh, one day and there is this mannequin clown 
lying in his driveway, face down in the same position that his father's body was in when it was found. Now, at this point in the story, Nicholas has been told that his application for the game has been rejected. So the clown then, you know, some sort of bizarre or sick joke. Of course, Nicholas would move it away from the front of his house. But he's a logical guy, right? I mean, he would put it maybe in the garage or in the garbage or in a shed someplace in the back of his property. He wouldn't bring it into his house. And he certainly would not lug it into his den, which is his sanctum sanctorum. For that matter, why would CRS bother to tell Nicholas that he'd been rejected? Because as soon as he gets that news, immediately the clown is at Nicholas's house. Was CRS trying to throw him off the scent? something? I'm not sure. Surely an intelligent man like Nicholas would make the connection between the game and this random clown showing up at his house. (laughs) It eventually becomes apparent that CRS is trying to steal Nicholas's money. The money seems to be the MacGuffin. If that's the case, why are they trying to kill Nicholas? For that matter, why bother with the game at all? I mean, it doesn't make sense that Nicholas even agreed to do the game in the first place. So if you're the the bad guy here, the villain trying to steal this guy's money, why plan an elaborate scheme to steal the money that way when there is very little chance that he will voluntarily enter the game? Like CRS, are, if they're thieves, they're not very good thieves. I mean, this is not Ocean's Eleven here. If theft is the goal, then Conrad is in on it because he's the one who gives the gift of the game to Nicholas in the first place. That first luncheon established that whenever Conrad got in trouble, Nicholas bailed him out. So if Conrad wanted all the money that Nicholas has, all he'd have to do is ask. Now, granted, he'd have to ask a number of times over a period of time to get little bits of money from um, Nicholas over time, but it would have been a lot easier for CRS to funnel money from Nicholas through Conrad than to, to create this big game. It doesn't make any sense. Now, we're meant to believe that the game is a con, and I mean, it is in a way. They're conning Nicholas into thinking that his life is really in danger, but we're led to believe that the con is to steal his money. Either way, Conrad is in on it. So to make the con work, Conrad has to be one heck of a good actor. Now, obviously, Sean Penn is a terrific actor. He has no trouble fooling us, the audience, into believing that he's still being chased by CRS and that CRS has not terminated his game and won't terminate his game, no matter how much money he pays them. But the question is, is Conrad a good actor? Are his acting skills at the level of Sean Penn's? So what I mean is, can Conrad fool Nicholas? Nicholas has been to hell and back with his brother over the years. He knows when Conrad is high or when there is something up. He can read his brother extremely well. Like most of us can read our siblings very, very well. So how likely is it for someone who is not an actor with no actor training, as far as we know, to convince his brother that the game is more than a game? I don't think that's very likely. I'm not buying that either. All right. I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to stop there. This is restraint. Maybe that's my New Year's resolution. I don't know. But I'm going to show restraint and stop there Um, because I think you get the idea. I see. I think you see where I'm going with this. Uh, And and believe it or not, I'm actually getting tired of talking. (laughs) Must be the end of the year. (laughs) All right. So, Melanie, what what did you think of the game? (laughs) Well, I have a confession to make. So I saw the game when it came out and I had forgotten that I saw the game when it came out. And then I watched it again this week and 
So I was watching it from a point of view of understanding that it, it really was all a game. So that was the bit that I remembered the most about the movie, that it is really all a game. And um, as soon as you know that, you can't watch it again and and have that same sense of what's going on. It really takes that away, the second watching, there's the second viewing. And I compare that to other Um, I suppose, left brain stories that I watch, even if I have seen them before. So if I'm watching a repeat of a show, you know, like um, a Hercule Poirot story, I usually can pick up that I've seen something before. But at the same time, I'm fascinated the second time and sometimes the third time that um, I'm watching a story and either can I remember how the murder was done And what clues are there and what fascination do I still have in watching things the second or the third time? And I find that far more intriguing as a story as opposed to the game, which I think is more gimmicky. And I I believe, Valerie, you know, as you've gone through and, and identified the plot holes and shown why it doesn't make sense, I think my, the way I explain it as a gimmick is really a summation of everything that that um that you have said so I wasn't excited by watching the movie this week um and I and I think I've got slightly different reasons as to why I didn't like it I didn't bother tracking the clues this week like I have done in the previous two weeks because I actually didn't think that that was going to be valuable for any of us. I didn't think that they led anywhere in particular and I think it would be pretty easy to pick up on what's not working and most of the clues are kind of there set up and then sometimes go, most of the time, don't go anywhere. So I also thought that this movie bought into a level of conspiracy theory, um, you know, as a puzzle, and I'm not really, uh, you know, there's a level of paranoia I think that this movie plays on and that doesn't really interest me as a as a story overall. Um, so I thought this week would be a good time to examine what is it that makes a mystery story and also have a look at what readers expect from mysteries. So, I've got a bit of a list here um, and it's a high level list, but you'll get the idea of really what it is and what sort of things you need to think about as you're going to write a mystery or something that takes a little bit more of your brain to work out what's happening, why it's happening. So there has to be some sort of crime or suggestion of a crime or a transgression of some sort. So what I'm trying to say here is that not all mysteries have to be crime stories. There can be perceived transgressions, something that throws the protagonist off or causes them to investigate. And this transgression or crime or suggestion is actually really the central conflict of the story. So you know, we focus, and I and I read a lot um, of murder mysteries. They're very prevalent and there's a lot of them to pick from, so it's very easy to get your hands on all sorts of murder mysteries. But some mysteries and some good examples of mysteries that don't include murder are the Friday Barnes series. So these are, these are children's books, but they are really good mysteries um, and they don't have murder in them most of the time. Uh, I think pretty much I've read all of them and I think people may die but it's more of a coincidence than it is actually the result of um, someone's nefarious uh, desire to kill someone. So that's a really good series if you want to understand or start to learn how to write um, mysteries and there's usually a couple of mysteries going on in them as well. There's the number one ladies detective agency series and particularly the first book, which are written by Alexander McCall Smith. Jane Eyre has elements of mystery in it, especially around Rochester and what's going on there. And there's also other things that I thought about during the week that are mysteries because I was watching something with my dad this week and it was about the search for the Holy Grail and the searches for the Ark of the Covenant. You know, there's other things that are mysteries like 
who is the Mona Lisa, and also how is Stonehenge built. So those are the sorts of things or setups I think that we can use to actually start a story. Um, and they don't always have to be murder mysteries. Now, as I mentioned just before, it's important to place the crime or the question or the transgression as the inciting incident of the story. So if you'd like of an example of what delaying that inciting crime or incident does to a story, then go back and listen to our study of Death on the Nile, which is episode seven in season two. And it really does, I think we do a really good job in that episode of looking at why delaying that significant event to the middle of your story doesn't work if you are writing a mystery. All right. The second thing is that the inciting incident should be an invitation to the reader or the viewer to join the protagonist in solving the puzzle. And it should also be an invite to the reader to potentially solve the puzzle before the protagonist um, because we should always, I think, be trying to see if we're smarter than the person who's actually in the story. And I think that's something that that leads that that works on our curiosity. So keep that in mind. The protagonist must also want to solve the puzzle, right? That becomes their object of desire. And as Valerie mentioned before, um, Nicholas doesn't really have an object of desire. He's not really trying to solve the puzzle or the problem in most of for most of the movie. So keep that in mind. And I emphasize this last week as well, that if you are going to write something that involves a puzzle, then you must plan when you're writing to have your protagonist's object as desire as wanting to solve that puzzle. I've read lots of stories where that doesn't happen and it and it's actually very flat and it's something that you really must focus on when you're writing those types of stories. Now, the antagonist. So the antagonist must be someone pulling the strings or they must be the person who has committed the crime or the transgression. And that person or that antagonist must have some sort of motive. Now, I know that sometimes this goes, you think that this is really obvious, but trust me, I don't think it's as obvious as people think it is. And I do think that the game is an example of where these things aren't obvious and therefore they don't work. As Valerie mentioned, there's a lot of things that aren't really right in this story and I do think that that's one of them. The antagonist, whoever it is in the game, they are pulling the strings but you don't really understand why and the only thing that makes sense is that it is a game. Um, and I know there's. it looks like at some stage they're trying to steal the money but I don't think that's that's really convincing because of all the other characters and how they operate within that story, um, particularly Connie. But anyway, <laughs> the settings are very important in mysteries. Um, you know, the settings can constrain the cast and the investigation, or they can open up many possibilities. So, you know, and some examples of that is we've looked at and examined closed room mysteries on the podcast before, you know, Agatha Christie is a perfect example of someone who used closed room mysteries or a very tight cast, a very specific setting to keep all of the cast and the characters in. Some other examples are the Hamish Macbeth series and also I think The Name of the Rose is a good example of having a kind of closed room, tight uh, cast of characters. Now, these type of stories usually have a set number of cast members and so suspects. And then the process of the mystery is working out which one did it, why they did it. And the options of everybody are generally kept open throughout all of the story. There's also, in terms of setting and space, open space, what I have now called open space mysteries, right? These are mysteries where anybody could be the suspect you know and we look at the silent if you look at the silent witness series law and order and those police procedural kind of stories where what they're actually trying to do 
is they have a very broad section of the population and they're trying to narrow down from the broad population to a pool and then gathering and then working out which which person did it. So they're really going from having a very large scope right down to getting the person that they that committed the crime. So the setting really can impact how your story is told and the types of things that you do in a mystery. And I particularly think in closed room mysteries or those very tight casted stories, that setting adds atmosphere. And we did see that last week in the dry, the setting of the drought in a country town really added to the atmosphere of the story. Now, and again, this next tip is <laughs> kind of obvious, but the game is an example of why it doesn't, um, it, it's maybe worthwhile stating, but there must be clues or a path to solve the puzzle in your story. Um, and the clues need to make sense and they need to eventually lead you to the resolution. Now, in line with that, there almost there also should be red herrings. So, you know, these are the false clues that lead the protagonist away from solving the puzzle. Now, as a writer or someone involved in trying to plot these stories, you must keep track of what clues and red herrings you're placing and where they are in the story. And you must also track the path your protagonist is following and how they interact with the clues or how the clues lead them to a certain or down a certain path. You, know, you are plotting in these stories a dance between the protagonist and the reader. The clues and red herrings are added in and eliminated throughout the story because of the investigation, and that is part of the dance that you're plotting. One of the techniques writers use to keep the readers engaged and potentially give them a chance to catch up with the investigation or how the mystery is progressing is that there are one or two points in the story where the protagonist summarises what's happened or what is happening. These points in the story include identifying what information is needed, so what information is missing, what's eliminated, and it resets the direction for the protagonist. And it also gives the reader a chance to catch up on what's going on. Now, there must be a moment in the story where the protagonist looks like they won't solve the puzzle. And that's really the all is lost moment in a mystery of some sort. And I think we all get to that point where we want to see that our protagonist is really stumped or just as stumped as us. And then finally, we move to the ending, which must be a satisfying resolution to the puzzle. And it usually includes an explanation of how the crime was committed or how the transgression came to be. Now, that is a very high level list of what makes a mystery. But I think there is something missing from my list or there are some things that are missing from my lists. Now, mysteries do have components that other stories don't have. And one of the things that you're doing is trying to engage the reader to walk with the protagonist in working out who did it and what motivated the crime or transgression and why. And if any of these things are revealed before the end of the story or by anyone other than the protagonist, then I don't think it's really a mystery or it's working at a slightly lower level than a full-blown mystery, in my opinion. So this leads me to the game and to do a quick analysis of that. So if we look at the rough list that I've just gone through, then we can start to work out, in my opinion, why the game isn't a mystery. So we know who did it, right? It's a game given to Nicholas by Connie and it's arranged by CRS. We know the why. It's a game that is designed to change the life of a man who wants for nothing. So the only outcome is for him to lose everything, but it's a game. So who is the antagonist? Is it Connie or is it CRS? And Valerie went through this a little bit before. What is the motive for the antagonist? And this is really something that's not clear, I think, in the movie. And 
Most of the time, I think we need to have empathy for the protagonist, particularly in the type of story that the game is. And in my in my opinion, I think Nicholas is a twat, right? <laughs> we are meant to believe that he has had a 180 degree change of personality because of the game. And to me, that's not convincing. And finally, I think Nicholas does everything the game wants him to do, especially at the end. You know, and then we see that his fall is broken by a bunch of bags in the middle of his birthday party. So I think this back, links back to what Valerie is talking about with Nicholas being a very passive protagonist. He he goes along with every single contrived situation that is put in front of him. And I don't think it's convincing for his character or for the story as a whole. Now, we're supposed to think that there is more going on when Nicholas starts to believe everything he has is at risk. And I believe that this is the point where our empathy is meant to shift towards him. And this is roughly at the midpoint of the movie. And it's a really hard sell. Now, this is an important point right here. As Valerie said throughout season six, we don't need to like a protagonist, but we do need to empathise with them. So if we start a story with a protagonist that we don't empathise with, then it is a massive task to create that empathy halfway through a movie. So perhaps the game is a good example of what not to do as a mystery or as a thriller for that matter. <laughs> I won't go on because I'm starting to bring myself down too. So, Valerie, what is the action step for this week? <laughs> All right. Well, for the action step, I want you to go back over the fundamentals of storytelling and relate them to your work in progress. Start with the four questions that I have mentioned many times. And as a review, here they are again. Who is the protagonist? What does she want? What or who is standing in the way of her getting it? And what happens if she doesn't get it? All right, so that wraps up this week's episode. Join us again next week when we discuss Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, Subscribe to Valerie's Inner Circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow her on X, Instagram and threads at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like my tips about books to help you read like a writer, visit me on Facebook, Instagram and threads at Melanie Hill Author or find out more about me at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm -hmm.